People think that the reason why people have weight problems, if we get an expert on TV or we have uh, some actress that we're going to ask her opinion about why it is that she stays thin, we're going to hear all kinds of things from people. Well, I do portion control. Yeah, well, we're going to find out how senseless that is. Uh, uh, lack of exercise is the problem. Too much stress, okay? Emotional eating, genes, fast food, too much snacking, childhood issues. Now, childhood issues. Let's see now. We've got areas of the world where people are getting enough to eat. We've got places where there's 2 billion people in Asia, and apparently none of them have childhood issues. There's not a single one of them is fat. <laughs> Those parents over there are incredible. They never step on anybody's little self-esteem toes. Yet in the United States, United States apparently 70 to 80% of the parents are just butchering the psychologies of their children since 7 or 8 out of 10 kids is going to wind up with a weight problem. <laughs> okay. The only thing is, it's a little weirder than that. Because over there in Asia, the cats and the dogs aren't having a weight problem either. But over in America, we must be mistreating our animals. or We're, we're putting the lid up and down on the kitty litter box a little too early or a little too late. There's something deep psychologically wrong with how we're raising our kittens because they wind up with this problem. Okay. The problem is not psychological. Weight problems are not psychological. Weight problems cause psychological problems. That's a whole different story. We have reverse cause and effect here, and the reversal of that cause and effect is tricky for people to understand. Sometimes it's very hard to know, you know which comes first, the chicken or the egg. It's very difficult to figure that out. So it's difficult for people in the midst of battling a weight problem to try to figure out, well, why am I having this problem? What is going on? Where did this start? How did this happen? And so, of course, they're going to look for psychological reasons why this must have happened, but they're looking in the wrong place. The weight problem is causing psychological turmoil. It causes a great deal of turmoil. Okay? It's, uh, it causes social prices to be paid, romantic prices to be paid, self-esteem, you know, uh, prejudice in the workplace. It causes all kinds of, of ha has all these kinds of ancillary problems that result from this, and uh, it, it's rough. And so, of course, people then, in the midst of that analysis, start thinking that maybe this problem is psychological, but it's not. Here we have <clears throat> Frisky. I uh, once lived with two cats. One of them looked like this. Kind of had my genes. <laughs> then there was one that looked like that. Spot. Cleverly named. <laughs> and it turns out that when I'd eat them, or excuse me, I didn't eat them, sorry. <laughs> AJ, you just enjoyed that just a little too much. <laughs> when I fed them, this is what I would see, their little smiling faces looking up at me. And one of them looked like that, and the other one looked like that. And yet, they were feeding out of exactly the same bowl. There's the artist. Now, that's important for us to understand. Like, in, in the United States, people are all pretty much eating the same food. If you look at any major analysis of what people are eating, the slender people, the slenderest people you know, uh, maybe not you because you're an unusual group that has ties with the hyper-health-oriented community, but if you, were, if you were a little more normal and weren't out in the whack end of the, of the continuum here, <laughs> If you had a friend, one of them that was thin and one of them that had a weight problem, those two people would be eating essentially the same food. Their, their food choices aren't any different. We've got maybe 10, 15 percent of the United States. We've got 30 or 40 million people that don't have weight problems. Let me tell you something. Those 30 or 40 million people, they're eating the same thing everybody else is eating. They're eating the same French fries, same hamburgers, same cheeseburgers, same ice cream. They're eating the same chips. They're eating all of the same things. Okay? They're both eating out of the same food bowl. One of them has a weight problem. One of them doesn't. We're going to try to figure out what the answer is. Why is it happening 
that some people and some cats and some dogs are having a problem. Here's where it starts. <clears throat> Everybody knows who this is, of course. This is Isaac Newton. Okay? Here's Isaac here. And he's sitting under an apple tree, and the apple drops and hits him on the head. And he says, I've got it. The moon is not falling to the earth, but the apple fell on the earth and it's accelerated down at whatever it is. We got the inverse square law. Okay, hold on a second. Before I get this all figured out, I'm going to have to invent differential and integral calculus. And some little hassles like that, but no problem. By the time I'm 24, I've got it all mapped out. And what he winds up was the law of gravity. The, uh, we have something else that's just as universal. You're going to see it all over the animal kingdom. It's the law of satiety. The law of satiety is that animals eating to full satisfaction or satiety in their natural habitat will, over time, neither eat too much or too little for optimum health. They're not going to do that. You've got millions of species out there. They're not having any problem. You've got trillions of individuals of those species. They're not having any problem. We're only having a few isolated little pockets in the world of a few little species that are having a problem. That's because something is not happening, and it cannot be that the law of satiety is being violated. Because the law of satiety is a natural law, it's just how it works. So what's happening here? So there's some, uh, just like when you see a rocket ship go up, you're not seeing a violation of the law of gravity or a, or a hot air balloon. You're just seeing a set of forces here that winds up uh, acting against each other, and then we get something that's curious. The same thing is happening when it comes to satiety. Here's a math problem. 45 years, so I'm a little older than that now, uh, I've eaten about, call it, Call it uh, about three or four pounds of food a day. Call it 1,000 pounds a year. 45,000 pounds more or less. Now, I know I don't look like it, but that's how it is. Eating about that much food. Now, if I were just 1% short, what would that mean? If I was 1% short, that means I would have been 450 pounds of food short by now. And if I was 450 pounds of food short, I would have had to cannibalize that food out of my own tissue which means I'd be a dead dug. There's no way I could have survived that. So I could not have survived eating 1% less food than I needed. If I ate 1% too much food, then I would have eaten 450 pounds of food too much, which means I would have stored quite a bit of fat on me. I might have 30 or 40 or 50 extra pounds of fat. Now that seems reasonable. So now what we're going to look at is we're going to look at data, for example, that takes the average woman in the United States between the ages of 20 and 40 and over that period of time, the average woman gains one pound a year. That means one pound a year is, call it, 3,500 calories a year. Over 365 days, it's about 10 calories a day. Nip by nip by nip by nip by nip. It's like a little drop on a rock. It's just gently taking place where the person is systematically overeating. They are not massively overeating. They are not completely out of control. The laws of satiety are working as hard as it can on this, on this creature to try to make sure that it eats the right amount of food, but it's missing a little bit, and it's missing always on the high side for some people and, in fact, most people. The reason why this is happening, uh, we're going to look at now, but we're going to now see uh, how it is that you could possibly engineer a creature to be so close to perfect. Because throughout the world, they aren't 1% off. They're perfect. You look at the gazelles, look at the crocodiles, look at the llamas, look at the cheetahs. They've all got it just right. None of these things are walking around 20 or 30 or 40 percent overweight. None of them. And as long as there's food, they're not starving to death. They're within very, very narrow targets of perfection, just as human beings are supposed to do. So if we have a mistake, those mistakes aren't large. They can be very, very small, uh, but they are inexorable. In other words, you, you cannot seem to stop them can't seem to keep pushing yourself away from the table with self-discipline. That does not seem to be the answer. The reason is, is that these are unconscious processes. And they are engineered or they're, uh, they're administrated through an area of the brain called the hypothalamus. Um, the hypothalamus does an awful lot of regulating uh, in the body. So, for example, it's regulating your fluid intake so that you get thirsty if you get a little bit low on fluid, and then, you're not, then you get satiated as soon as you've had enough. It's going to regulate your sleep. So if, you get, if you're short of sleep, you feel it, and then you feel a pressure in order to sleep. 
Uh, if you get uh, cold or too hot, you feel like moving to an area that's, that's better. In other words, you're constantly moving and adjusting to try to uh, put yourself in idealized circumstances for survival. The same thing is going to happen with food. There's no reason why this shouldn't work perfectly. Each and every one of you in here, every single one of you, has a perfectly functioning satiety mechanism. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay? Some of you are having more weight problems than others. Some of you aren't having any weight problems. The reasons we're about to look at. The, uh, the satiety mechanism in the hypothalamus is going to be sensitive to inputs from the digestive system. And uh, there's going to be many mechanisms. I'm just going to look at one example of how, this can, uh, how these problems can, can be generated. You have uh, both in your digestive system both nutrient receptors and stretch receptors. So your, your, your stomach is designed by nature to cause you to tell you to stop eating when it's been stretched out, when the receptors are getting evidence that there, there's no reason to put any more in there, that we've got about as much as we can handle. And so that's a primary method by, a uh, short-term method by uh, when most animals, including people, say that they've had enough. If you put more in there, it starts to get them into pain. So that, that's a regulating system uh, to help us eat about the right amount of food. But that's not enough. Because if you we were only designed by nature just to be paying attention to stretch receptors, then we could simply fill your stomach with a bunch of uh, lettuce and we could put a pound of lettuce in there, which would only be about 100 calories, and you would feel fully satiated. And yet, if we did that three or four times a day, which is about what you're designed to do, is eat about three to five pounds of food a day, if we did that, you'd only eat three or four or 500 calories, and you would starve to death, because you cannot survive on that. So the, the, the uh, nervous system cannot simply depend on stretch reception, because it's not adequately reliable. You need to actually have another system, and that system is going to be nutrient reception so that the, your digestive system can detect fat, sugar, and protein. It can actually find out and count how much of each of those things that you put in there. So they can actually uh, figure out all things considered about how many calories did we eat. And uh, that's how that's going to work. So you've got uh, different kinds of receptors in there doing its best to say how many, you know, of this food that you just put in there, how much of the fat did I get, how much of the carbohydrate, how much protein, how much of this is just fiber. And so all together it works together as a counting system or as an accounting system to try to tell you when it is that you should stop eating and when you need to continue. Now, the, uh, so this is what they are. So they're just a calorie estimation system. Uh, with stretch receptions to tell you sort of by volume that you've had about enough. But then the nutrient receptors, uh, receptors are actually a little more sophisticated, trying to give you a, an accurate count. Obviously, if you ate a bunch of lettuce and a slice of bread, then it could say, okay, well, that slice of bread is a lot more concentrated than just the lettuce, so we've got to give you more credit uh, for how much it is that you just ate so that we don't, we don't uh, want to overeat. Okay, so this is all how this thing is being balanced. Now, it all sounds great, except now we're going to look at two people, one of them that doesn't have a weight problem and one of them that does. And we're going to now look here, and we're going to see that this guy here, uh, who has a really cool goatee, by the way, this guy has a bunch of stretch receptors, and he's got fat receptors, for example, in his stomach, and this guy has stretch receptors, and he has fat receptors in his stomach. So, so far, so good. Everybody's on an even playing field but we've got a mystery here about why one of them is having a weight problem and one of them isn't. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put in 500 calories of whole natural food. It's going to have a bunch of colors to it. It isn't going to just be one thing. We're going to have some salad and we're going to have some red beans or whatever it is. We're just going to put a bunch of food in there. And what's in that food mostly is going to be fiber. And the reason is, is that's what most whole natural food is, is fiber and water, actually. The, uh, you can look at this, obviously, because pure carbohydrate is, I think, about 1,800 calories a pound, and pure protein is 1,800 calories a pound, and pure fat is 4,000 calories a pound. Yet, whole natural food is 100 calories a pound for lettuce, 200 calories a pound for most vegetables, 300 calories a pound for fruit. If the, if the caloric constituents of food are 1,800, 1,800, and 4,000 calories a pound, and yet the food itself is only three, four, 500 calories a pound, it must be that the majority of that food is fiber and water. And that is exactly what it is. So what we do is we put a whole bunch of food in here 
We might put like a pound of food in there, and the average calorie density of that food might be 500 calories. So we have some berries at 300 calories a pound, and we've got some potatoes and beans at five or 600. On average, we put some food in there, we get 500 calories. And that's just the right amount of food that this guy needed to say, that's all the food that I need for the next several hours, and to hit the satiety mechanism. It stretches out his stomach. The little calorie receptors are, are in there determining what the fat content is and the protein and the carbohydrate content. And he says, thanks for the 500. I'm all happy. That's just what I needed for my optimum function right now. No problem. Just like every other creature on Earth. Now, our guy right next to him has exactly the same equipment. We put the same calories in there. And he also has the same response. And when he reaches that 500 calories, a little switch will go on in his head and he'll say, I'm fully satiated. I don't want any more food. And you might say, oh, no, he doesn't. He has a weight problem. That guy's going to keep eating. He's going to keep eating more food. That's why he's got a weight problem. No, it's not. It's not why he has a weight problem. He does not eat past this mechanism. His mechanism works just as well as the other guy's mechanism. There's nothing wrong with him. Now, what's the problem? The problem looks like this. There's actually uh, several problems, but we're going to look at this one. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put some chocolate shake and cheesecake or something like this in the first guy's gut. And what's going to happen is, is that we're going to put only 500 calories in there because that's about how much he needs for the next few hours. Except that because it's some chocolate shake and a cheesecake, it's very, very concentrated food. So it's not a big bunch of food now. This isn't a big bunch. It's now a lot smaller because it's about 1,500 calories a pound. But when we put it in there, the stretch receptors aren't going to be as active because it's only about a third as much food. But yet, he still says, thanks for the 500, because he can count up all those calories so effectively because here he's got fat receptors that are going absolutely crazy. They're saying, wow. You just gave us something really, really fatty. Oh, boy, is that a lot of calories. That's about 500 calories we've eaten already. And he's done. He's not interested in having any more food, even though his stomach's only one-third full. He's had enough. Now, problem here is that this fella, when we put the very same 500 calories into his stomach, it only fills at one-third. And his stretch receptors are saying, well, that's not very much food, but I feel a lot of fat in this food. So there's more calories in it than just one-third of that other meal that we had the other day, which would have been, what, one-third of 500 would have been about 170 calories. So he says, this isn't 170 calories. It's more than that. I think there's a lot of fat in here. My fat receptors are singing. I think there's about 400 calories. But you know what? I need 500. So uh, I want another 100 calories. So now he eats another 100 calories. But now he's had 600, not 500. But he thinks he's had 500. And now our guy just systematically overate. Why did that happen? That happened because, oops, as we look in here, we see he doesn't have as many fat receptors. So when we fill his stomach with a really, really high-fat food, those receptors can only signal so fast and so long, and they can't pick it up. They're not sensitive enough. Whereas this guy over here has a ton of fat receptors, and so when we throw a super high-fat meal in there, you can figure it out. Individual differences. This is one of many individual differences that there are in satiety mechanisms, but this is probably going to be determined to be a very, very important one. Uh, the reason why I say that is rat studies have already shown that this predicts you know, which rats are going to gain a lot of weight on a high-fat diet quite well.